Hi, Blogging Head viewers. This is uh, Con Carol with Garants here today. Um, big red uh, Wrigley Spearmint t-shirts are not standard issue for hotline staff, but unfortunately I left my dress shirt at home uh, when I biked in this morning. So uh, we'll be a little dressed down in addition today, but uh, as, as Garants will tell you, this will not be first wardrobe-related event for this Blogging Head session. Yes, we originally planned to do this in uh, while I was out in Iowa over the last three weeks, and unfortunately, there was um, you know I, I thought I would set it up as you know a nice sort of si uh, sight scene. I did it outside. I was sitting against the tree. Um, I was wearing you know it's very hot out. I was wearing a t-shirt, and then I just I just realized that upon viewing the visual that um, there was there was a minor wardrobe malfunction that I wouldn't have noticed if I had not some, carefully reviewed some the less than professional shots, huh? I, I just felt that given Robin Givens' columns <clears throat> and other recent controversies, I would err on the side of caution and just reshoot the thing. <laughs> um, well, we're, we're all for caution here at Blogging Hands. It's, it's yes. a family, family uh, it's website. It's a family website. And uh, frankly, okay. there was really nothing much going on. It just, you know, it, I just felt uh, Robin Given has uh, created a, a whole new era of containment. Some, some lost footage of Blogging Hands fans will never see. Um, but moving on to today's session, uh, we're, we're uh, looking at the uh, political situation as, as the uh, campaign moves to the fall, kind of a fall kickoff preview here. And uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about why Iowa is so important for the caucuses, and then uh, Garance will tell about her recent trips to Iowa. Um, basically, the, uh, everyone knows Hillary Clinton is far ahead in the national polls, uh, but when you look down to specific states, mm -hmm. uh, most, most importantly Iowa, We'll see that it's a lot, lot closer. Everyone's basically within the margin of error. And if you look back historically uh, to the past, ever since there has been Iowa caucus that have been before the New Hampshire uh, uh, primaries, you'll see that there's generally an average of about a 14.5 bump that the first place finisher out of Iowa gets. And uh, also uh, the, the third place finisher out of Iowa generally gets around uh, negative four points in New Hampshire polls. And this is important because this pretty much makes Obama, Edwards all viable as long as they can show well in Iowa and Hillary stumbles. So with that preview as to how Iowa still could make a race out of the Democratic uh, primary, Grants, uh, what did you see in Iowa? Well, I saw a race that was a much more open than a lot of people are, um, are acting as though it is right now. Um, it is a very, very open contest. Um, I think that the... Uh, John Edwards is doing much better than I think a lot of people um, think. I mean, nationally, uh, he's, uh, you know, people are not taking him quite that seriously anymore. But I think in Iowa, you know, he obviously has a very good operation on the ground. He has a lot of his precinct captains in place from the last cycle. He's, I think, the only one who has all of his precinct captains in place. And that's a hard thing to do because there's 1,784 precincts in 99 counties. And so you need a lot of people on the ground. Um, in order to um, to win. Now, the thing that's really interesting with regard to Edwards in Iowa is that Edwards is running um, a campaign that's very focused on the rural counties, but um, in the last cycle, he actually um, won primarily the counties that were within the Des Moines media market. And I think that's where uh, Clinton and Obama are going to be making the strongest place, too. So it's even more competitive um, you know, than we think, just because they're all going to be trying to win... Um, those uh, those more metropolitan counties and the population in Iowa also over the last four years has become um, increasingly metropolitan. Um, it's a dynamic that we're seeing all over the country with the rural counties as say, as with most depopulating, the um, economic decline, economic uh, you know decline in manufacturing, especially along the um, the sort of uh, towns in the Mississippi River Valley um, in uh, western Iowa, uh, eastern Iowa. Did you get out to any of the uh, bus tour stops he had in in, uh, in rural counties? Yeah, I did, um, in some of these smaller communities. And, you know, he was getting crowds of about 150, 200 people. Um, interestingly, a lot of them had never seen John Edwards before. And there's this impression that, oh, you know, John Edwards has been living in Iowa. And, yes, he has been there a lot. He's been there more than any of the others. However, um, it's still a very big state, and a very small population of uh, potential voters actually attends the caucuses and is engaged in politics. And so it's possible that he was... Um, it's possible for him to still, you know, find people who, who've never seen him before. And to, and, yep. and to the extent that, you know, people in the press and in Washington feel like they know John Edwards, they've seen John Edwards, they've watched John Edwards change, I think he still has some potential to introduce himself to voters fresh in Iowa. And that was very surprising to me. 
And what, what are some of the issues that the, the more rural voters are uh, focusing on? I think the issues in Iowa are much the same that, you know, um, they are nationally. Iraq obviously being very important, um, although the question around Iraq is, is less specifically how are we getting out of there, but, um, I mean, that's obviously a huge part of it, but also how do we restore America's standing in the world? That's a very big concern that people have. There is a sort of more nebulous category of questions around um, the Constitution where people are. And what, yeah, what, what um, do people mean by that? No, they, they say, you know, specifically, you know, America has gotten away from the Constitution. This president is ignoring the Constitution. What are you going to do to bring us back to the Constitution? So there's the sense that... Um, do, they, do they ever phrase us as in terms of civil liberties, or, or is it It's is not it, you know, phrased specifically as civil or? liberties. Um, there's questions about interrogation and torture, but I think a lot of the categories that we have for thinking about politics are not actually broadly shared um, by the people in Iowa. So, for, so for, voters don't get up and say, what about wiretapping or FISA? It's much more of a nebulous kind of It's a little more nebulous. Issue. I mean, they will list that, but, uh, but the, the overarching category is the Constitution. It's not civil liberties. Civil liberties, I think people think civil liberties, they think free speech rights, right? When they think say, fighting for porn or the rest of it. They, you know, they don't associate it with something they care about. Right. It's, it's not the category of issues they're talking about right now, which is the Constitution. And you see this on the Republican side as well, and you see it particularly in Ron Paul's campaign, where his whole campaign is about, you know, um, what do they call him, Dr. No, and there's these pictures of him with um, the, uh, the paddles reviving the Constitution as if it were a, um, uh, a, uh, a patient in a hospital. Yeah, well, let, let's not forget that Ron Paul was against um, the Civil War, our, our, our Civil War. So... <laughs> He has his own constitution he's fighting for. Uh, um, yeah, um, definitely. I mean, one of the other things I thought that was really interesting, I was in um, this town in, in Burlington with John Edwards, which is, um, you know, the original capital of the Iowa Territory. And, um, you know, reasonably small, very nice scene, middle of the day, very hot outside, Mississippi River in the background, beautiful bridge across this Mississippi River. You know, there's a woman who gets up and asks him about taxes. She's very unhappy with the idea that he might raise taxes. He gives mm -hmm. her an answer to the question. And then afterwards, I'm talking to her, and her real complaint, apparently, and the reason she's worried about taxes is because they're losing all the big jobs, as she describes it. And she's like, we're, you know, we're losing all these big jobs. All that we're getting in, in, in exchange are these just these little jobs, like down at the mall. And what she means is... The manufacturing sector is in decline, and it's being replaced by a service economy where the jobs don't pay as well. And, you know, the state just issued a report today in Iowa showing that, you know, the new jobs that are being created pay about three or $4,000 less than the, some of the average old jobs that are going away. And how did she create – how did she link that to taxes? She described it as little jobs and big jobs. Okay. But – we would describe so just kind of like a more nebulous, you know, economic a service economy right. versus manufacturing right. economy. But she didn't even have the sort of framework for thinking about what was happening in her environment in that way. And so, it just when you when people ask questions, they're asking them from a very um, less politically attuned framework. But they, but we know it. You know, you know what they're talking about. It's, it's something a question we might frame under like NAFTA or trade. Right, exactly. And ultimately, it's probably a trade issue. Um, uh, and, and, and the way the trade issues come up is, is also interesting because it's not just about jobs going to foreign countries. It's about foreign companies now own manufacturing units um, in America. And so that the people who are, say, working in Keokuk are no longer working for an American company. They're working for, say, an Italian parts manufacturer. They're working for a French firm. And so there's a sense of a loss of sovereignty. Um, and this is something that comes up a lot on the Republican side, a little bit on the Democratic side as well, this real concern over um, American sovereignty and are we in charge of our own country anymore. Uh, I've even seen a lot of uh, my DD comment boards, people talking about uh, stops they've made and seen Edwards Live. There's been lots of immigration questions coming up. Did you see any uh, immigration questions on the Democratic yes, side? Yes, there were immigration questions, definitely. And it's a big applause line for Edwards when he says that, you know, um, people should learn how to speak English. Um, that's uh, one of the strongest applause lines that he gets. Um, is, it, is that about as far as it goes? There's no other talk of fences or borders or comprehensive no, he's immigration. Not, he, it's just... He's not supporting a fence. Um, I don't think any of the Democrats are supporting a fence. Um, Rudy Giuliani, who I, I saw, um, he does support a fence, and it's a huge applause line for him saying, you know, build a fence. And it's a very simple message, and it's exactly what the Republicans want to hear right now. No, but it, it's still, you know, in some ways it is an issue for the Democrats, too, who, who like the, you know, make them learn, learn English line as well. 
Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, learning English is something that I think a lot of people think would be good for everybody economically. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's hard for people to manage in this country if they can't speak the language. Um, and so there's, there's obvious incentives all around for people to learn English and for there to be, you know, superior ways of, of, of integrating immigrants into the economy and into the mainstream of the country. What about Obama? What's his biggest issue that he's pushing in, in uh, Iowa? Um, he's very focused on a um, systematic reform message, um, transformation. I mean, he's doing this very interesting thing where he's not... I mean, Clinton is doing a much more interest group-based style of campaigning where she'll uh, sort of say things that specifically address particular constituencies, and Obama is um, trying to go beyond the traditional Democratic constituencies and to sort of build his own grassroots army uh, of people. And I think he's going to need to do that, because especially with the unions, he's probably not going to get any of the major union endorsements. And in fact, I was at the the Hawkeye Labor Council forum a couple of weeks ago in Cedar Rapids, and um, you know the candidates were all giving their speeches. It was one of these cattle calls, and um, Obama got heckled by this union audience. I mean, it was one individual, and he was drunk, as I discovered when he I was just having a good time to talk to him afterwards. Yeah, I mean, because it was you know it was one of these events where it's like it was like the AFL-CIO debate what did you say in, to heckle Obama in, um, in Chicago, except with beer and barbecue. Um, right. So an even more rowdy crowd. But still, well, you know, I mean, if, if somebody, you know, gets heckled at a Netroots thing, it's reported. And, um, and I thought it was sort of interesting that this person said to, you know, Obama, oh, you know, you've never worked a day in your life. Uh, and you, you, you talked to the gentleman afterwards? I did. He was drunk. Okay. I mean, you could smell there was alcohol on his breath. No, no other, no other, did, did he soften up on Obama afterwards, or is he, or is he still, uh, I mean, did you get a sense that that was uh, feeling elsewhere within the union crowd, or is it was just one guy? No, I mean, Obama night? actually did this thing where he, got, he really got the crowd going, and I, I blogged about this a little bit, about how, uh, you know, he had, did this whole call and response based on something that um, this elderly lady did with him in South Carolina to get the crowd going about, you know, uh, fired up, ready to go, fired up, ready to go, and a call and response. And, you know, get the whole crowd very into it, very lively, very engaging. And this is apparently something he does on the stump. He does it in union audiences. He does it in front of African-American audiences. And it's a, a kind of um, uh, hotter, more impassioned Obama than people, I think, are used to seeing, um, especially in Washington, because, you know, when he comes through here, he's talking to these more sedate, you know, suit-wearing audiences and um, will often give them either a um, more uplifting or more um, uh, professorial type of speech, but less of a rabble-rousing one. And how's his uh, kind of, I guess you call it a systematic change message going over? Is that resonate among everyone, or is there certain segments it does better with? I mean, he obviously attracts a lot of young people to his events, and um, that's going to be interesting to watch in Iowa. I don't know how important the student vote is going to be. It's... Um, I mean, the caucuses, I think they attract something like 83% of the people last time were over the age of 30, and it was 91% um, uh, of the people in 2000 were over the age of 30. So, you know, it's possible he may get a lot more young people involved, and if he can do that, then, you know, he can really um, swing things in an interesting way. Uh, but on the other hand, the caucuses are going to take place when a lot of the universities are on their winter break. Everyone's going to be scattered all over the state. You know, some people, uh, uh, the state Democrat, like, uh, the state college Democrats, are optimistic that you know maybe people will go to their home caucuses and caucus with their families uh, in their home precincts, and um, that this might actually increase the power that students have because they'll be um, caucusing in these environments where each vote has more of an impact. But the people who I know who are more experienced watchers of Iowa politics are very um, shy of that idea and think that basically just the students are not going to be very important this time around. Yeah, I saw that. that uh, it was an online piece you wrote for CAPT. Yeah. On, yeah uh, I think you said everybody but uh, Iowa State, the Cyclones, are going to be still out for uh, Right, Iowa State break. is, is going to be back um, on January 14th, and uh, right now the caucuses are still going to be on January so 14th. Right, so they come back. Their first day classes are that actual first day. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, if you remember, you know, your own college days, it's very hard to get anything major done on your first day of classes because you're basically still sorting out your schedule for the whole year. You're maybe unpacking a little bit. You're seeing people you haven't seen all summer. It's, um, there's a lot of things to do other than engage in political activity. Did you get any, did you run the uh, article past uh, Obama's team at all? Did you get any response to any... Uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I quoted the them in the vote. story, and they said, you know, they said that they also felt like maybe there would be some opportunity um, for people to caucus in their home precincts and that this might actually wind up having a more of an effect in terms of the rural counties. Um, 
you know, it's yeah, possible. I mean, I, I mean if, to... it would be a real feat of organizing if you could do that. If you could organize people in, um, at say, a University of Iowa and Iowa City to then go back to their home caucuses so that you're organizing people for different, different counties and different precincts out of Iowa City. I mean, that would be a real feat to be able to accomplish that. But it would be very challenging as well. Yeah, I'm gonna have to share the uh, skepticism of your uh, the people you interviewed. It, it just seems to me. Uh, I remember reading uh, New York Times coverage of Howard Dean's um, student volunteers in Iowa uh, in 2004, and you know, like everyone else in DC, I had no idea uh, if all the Dean momentum was going to produce any votes. But I remember seeing pictures of these, uh, you know, basically flop houses where all these students were um, partying all night. I mean, there were pizza boxes everywhere out on the lawn. I just remember thinking to myself, oh my God, there's no way that's going to go over well with the locals. Right. Right. And and I think all those influx of, of you know, well, students Well, interestingly, in. Kerry won all the student precincts in Iowa. Oh, he did? Yeah. Dean won, oh, Dean won only, um, I mean, he won the, he, and he, he won only overall, I think it was four counties. And mm-hmm. like I said, you know, um, Kerry actually won the east and the west part of the state. So Kerry won the rural counties and Edwards won the Des Moines media market. It's really interesting. It's not necessarily what you'd expect. And this time around, Edwards has, you know, um, a, a county coordinator for every uh, each of the 99 counties as well as a rural county coordinator for each of the 99 counties. And so he's really emphasizing this rural message. But ultimately, like, I don't know if those are the people who are going to be going to the caucuses. Yeah, it's really hard to tell. It's uh, really hard to tell. I mean, half the people who are going are probably going to be people who went last time, and then half of them are going to be new. And so every time it's this whole different group of people. Is it really half? I mean, I would I would think that the more new people bringing in, that's better news for uh, Obama. Whereas if we're if we're seeing the same types of people, that's that's probably better news for Clinton. Um, I think that's accurate. Um, in previous years, I mean, it, this it's hard to, for people who are you know professional political scientists to even figure out who's exactly attending the caucuses. They're not very well studied um, at the level of uh, survey research, but. Um, yeah, the polls are the, all over the The place understanding tonight. is that between 40 and 60 percent of caucus goers each cycle are new to the to the system. Really? Mm-hmm. 40 to 60 percent. Mm-hmm. I did not know that. So it's um, it, there's a lot of uh, turnover. Um, but that said, it's much much more commonly an older audience. And that actually, I think, is going to be... I mean, my understanding is that Clinton has, you know, the sort of middle-aged women's vote sewn up in Iowa. Um, and, and and Obama has made this decision not to participate in any more of the um, uh, cattle calls other than the officially sanctioned ones um, and, and the debates. And I think in Iowa in particular, that's going to hurt him because there's this big one that the AARP is doing. And yeah, the AARP I, is running a campaign in Iowa right now where every single forum you go to, there is a row of women in their 80s wearing red AARP t-shirts sitting in the front row with their hands up. Um, the AARP is so organized right now in Iowa. And um, there's a lot of retirees who have um, nothing else to do. And the AARP is very big in their life. It's like a social group. It's it's like a lodge. It's not just an advocacy organization. It's a community thing for them. And 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 they're going to want someone who's addressing their issues specifically this year more even than usual, I think. Yeah, my the blogger I read from Iowa every day, uh, Bleeding Heartland, um, I think it was either uh, Chris Woods or um, uh, Des Moines Dem, who was... Uh, calling on Obama to shake up his staff after he made the announcement that he was he wasn't going to go to that AARP forum. This is someone who is well who's actually more open to Edwards, but you know, definitely is, is in the, you know, ABC anybody but Clinton crowd. And uh, you know, very disappointed that Obama wasn't going to be going to this AARP um, right. cal- as you call it, call in Iowa and had sworn off any other type of uh, non uh, DNC sanctions events yeah. in Iowa. Yeah, he's not um, doing the traditional outreach to interest groups, you know. And well, no, I mean, you know, that because it, it, it would conflict with his message. His message is, I'm going to bring an end to, to special interest politics, right? Um, but the so, question is, can you can you bring an end to special interest politics and win a Democratic primary at the same time? That it, no, it's it's, it's a really it's open a, question, and we don't question. know. Maybe he can. I mean, I don't see anything in Iowa that's anything like what Dean was doing last cycle. Everybody's more organized. Um, everybody's in better shape. Um, there's uh, one person was telling me from one of the campaigns that there are there are more people uh, working at the campaigns in Iowa today, um, or you know, like a week ago, than there were right. um, on January first, uh, two thousand four. 
If you had to rank the, uh, the, the, the three top campaigns as far as uh, organization on the ground in Iowa, just from what you saw, how would you rank them? That's a very difficult question. Um, I mean, you said my sense is that Clinton Edwards is Ed, Edwards has a head start in that he has people who work for him last cycle who are still with him. Um, he has precinct captains on the ground. He's got his 99 county chairs in place and his rural county chairs um, are in are going into place. Um, he knows the state really, really well. He knows a lot of the political people. Um, he uh, is probably going to get support from the local unions. I suspect the Teamsters um, in particular. He's he's done work walking with them on picket lines. Um, but it, does, it doesn't look like the national is going to endorse him. But do you think he'll get the local? He, he may very well get the local. Um, and, uh, you know, he has a solid operation. It feels very professional. It feels very general election style. You know, he's going around the state in this big bus, and um, he's got everything down to a science at this point in terms of his operation in Iowa. That and said, what, what, he what, doesn't, what he doesn't have is... Um, the kind of novelty and enthusiasm. I mean, there are still people who haven't seen him, but it's not the kind of novel. He doesn't have the star quality that Clinton and Obama have. Um, on the other hand, it means that people are coming to see him or coming to see him because they want to see him, and it's not just that they're just gawking, because there's a certain amount of gawking that goes on with Clinton and Obama where it's people just want to see them because they want to see them. They're never going to caucus. Um, Obama's what about Obama's organization? I remember they seem very uh, well organized. They have more offices than the others. Um, they have a lot of small offices. They're keeping things very grassroots for reasons that are unclear. I mean, they have a huge amount of money, obviously, but, you know. All what does that this, mean when you say they're keeping things grassroots? Well, this is what I'm going to – all of the big signs outside their offices are hand-painted. And they have okay. this whole thing about hand-painted signs. So when you go to an event, there will be the big Edwards signs that say, you know, this is John Edwards' country, and it's, you know, big and, and – Professionally done. Professionally or, yeah, done, plastic. red, white, and blue, per perfect. Right. Um, and then there's Obama, and everything there is painted in tempera paints. And there's a lot of green colors as well. And there's corn, and there's like the, the Obama sun that's rising, and it's all very sort of pretty and grassroots. Um, but I feel like that's an affectation because obviously they have the money to do it some other way if they want to. Um, <laughs> they're not poor. No, they're not poor. Um, Hillary has uh, is, doesn't seem to be engaging quite as much in the kind of sign more aspect of the campaigning. Um, there's a little bit less of that that she's doing. Um, and, you know, she's obviously, I think, attracting women who have not gone to caucuses before. Um, and they just, they love her. They, they're, like, in love. Um, you know, just, and, and a lot of women with ch with daughters as well who are looking to her as someone who can um, uh, provide a, a role model for their daughters. Um, yeah, I was, I was actually an Eagle Scout myself, so I, I was interested in that uh, post you did on the, uh, the Girl Scout badges mm -hmm. you saw. Do you want to... Share that with the... Uh... Yeah, um, so the Ms. Foundation for Women um, uh, has... Uh, I'm sorry, no, was, no, I'm sorry, the White House Project, not the Ms. Foundation for Women. The White House Project um, in 2002 arranged with the Girl Scouts to be doing a badge, uh, a little Ms. President badge. And um, and so I was at uh, Polly Butka's Corn Boil in, um, in Clinton, Iowa, Clinton, Clinton. And, uh, you know, I saw these Girl Scouts and they had these badges. I was like, we didn't have those. I was a little Girl Scout. And, you know, they've been doing them since 2002. And I sort of wonder to what extent they act as, like, ongoing advertisements for Senator Clinton because it's not like there's anybody else at risk of becoming a Ms. President in the next <laughs> cycle. <laughs> not anytime soon. You know, so, I mean, all these little girls are wearing them and their moms want them to wear them because it's, you know, it's about being anything that you can, you know, being anything and having all these opportunities and all this possibility. But at the same time, it's this sort of, like, little backdoor, like, hey, you know, there's a woman running for president right now. Do, do you feel, do you get any backlash from uh, voters in Iowa that, you know, Hillary Clinton is a special interest candidate? I mean, we talked about her kind of pitching herself to women. She's going to all the AARP stuff. Right. She's definitely not shying away from the, you know, I mean, she's, she's recasting you know, Barack Obama's special interest tag. But basically, you know, her, her message is, you know, I'm working within the system. This is how it works. How, how, how is that, you know, uh, contrast playing among the voters that you saw? Um, I haven't, I mean, you know, the public polling shows that lobbyists are extremely unpopular, and so by associating her with them and associating her with an unpopular establishment in Washington, you know, it's, um, it's 
a campaign strategy that Edwards and Obama are having to take because, you know, earlier ones didn't really work that well. I mean, obviously, if Edwards had made headway with his, you know, I apologize for the war and why won't she apologize for the war strategy, he would be pounding that a lot more than he is these days. Um, but it didn't make any difference on the polling data. Yeah, so that, the that shift. fell flat on the, I remember that debate line and just went... Like yeah, the polling data room. shows that there's virtually no correlation between people's you know pers uh, perspectives on that and who they're supporting. And part of it has to do with the fact that women are more anti-war and women like Hillary Clinton for other reasons. And so to the extent that you're trying to get that group, there's, this, there's these weird overlaps where... Um, in any event, so, you know, they've gone off with this different attack line on Clinton now with the lobbying stuff and the special interest stuff. And it'll be interesting to see if that works. Obviously, you know, they, they think... Um, since both Edwards and Obama are doing it, they, they must think that it will have some success. And I assume it will have some success. The things I hear people saying about Clinton, though, that um, were more concerning to them, it was, it was a concern about her hawkishness. Um, uh, people felt that she might women, be overcompensating for being female and yeah. be too tough. Um, and then I heard, you know, I was talking to someone else who's a construction worker. And he was supporting Giuliani, and um, he was saying to me, you know, that uh, for him it would um, he'd be he'd be happy to support a woman, um, you know, except that Hillary Clinton uh, was a bitch, and he'd vote for a woman, but he wouldn't vote for a bitch. <laughs> and um, I, I feel like there's there's that tension in her campaign where she has to appear tough in order to get people to think that she's tough enough. Um, uh, to be commander in chief and to meet the commander in chief test, um, where this person was supporting Giuliani solely because of seeing him as a commander in chief, um, and at the same time not coming off as basically being a bitch, which is how a lot of women who seem tough are perceived. And so it's it's a very tricky line. Well, let me let me go back to your earlier point because I thought that was a great one about the uh, when you when you look at survey data, it's it's actually women who are generally more anti-war. So that's kind yeah. of a, a bore for Hillary and not letting Obama and Edwards gain anti-war traction is that the most anti-war voters are women and women love Hillary. So when you talk about there's a concern about her being uh, hawkish, uh, who do you hear voicing that? Is it is it men or women? Um, I've heard that from both men and women. I mean, obviously, I'm just talking to people. I'm not doing surveys, so my... Research no, is just purely you know, anecdotal, like, but I've, I've heard it from both men and women, but also from particularly from women, I think. Particularly from women? Yeah. Okay. Um, but, you know, Iowa voters in general tend to be somewhat less hawkish. Yes, yeah, it's always been more of an anti-war state. Yeah, definitely. On uh, the other hand, one thing I do want to note, though, is that... Um, the anger around the war and the anger about the direction of the country, you feel it definitely on the Democratic side, but um, the Republican side and the Republican audiences are much, much angrier than the Democratic ones. And I feel that the, the Republicans are going through their, what the Democrats went to, through in 2003 and 2004 with Howard Dean when there was this, just, this rawness, this like what the hell has happened kind of anger. Um, and, you know, the Democrats having just gone through a successful election in 2006 in Iowa, you know, they have the state house and the governor's mansion for the first time in more than 40 years. Um, there's a sense that things are on the upswing. It's a waiting game now to get rid of Bush. Bush is not running for re-election. Um, whereas the Republicans are suddenly, you know, they're losing. Their president has humiliated them. They feel embarrassed. Um, uh, people are mocking them. And, and so there's a real um, discontent on the Republican side that is interesting to watch. Yeah, how how is that kind of manifesting? Is it is it more anti-war, or anti-Bush, or uh, what, what are what are some of the the, the sentiments you're getting? You, you saw in Iowa from, um, from Republicans. It's uh, I, I I heard a lot of men who are who are talking about um, America's loss of status in the world, and they take this very personally. Like it's a kind of personal affront. They're used to thinking of themselves as. Um, you know, these sort of light unto the nations and and the idea that the world hates us now is just personally offensive to them. And, um, you know, I think the Republicans, a lot of them still want to win the war. Uh, I think the Democrats recognize that that's not in the cards. It's not going to be possible. Um, but they're all very upset about the direction that things have gone. This is not what they signed up for with the president. And uh, some of them are also... You know, they're unhappy that people hate the president, um, and that makes them feel bad. They, 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 they feel, um, they take that personally. That the president is so unpopular. Um, uh, you also spend a day with the Huckabee campaign, I hear. 
Um, I spent a little time with the Huckabee uh, campaign office. I didn't actually spend time following Huckabee around the state because he hasn't been around the state that much. Um, but he, he did play second in the Iowa Straw Poll. He did play second in the Ames Straw Poll. And um, it was really quite a feat if you think about how much money they had going into it. They had very little money going into it. They have three staffers in the state. Three paid staffers. I mean, each of, you know, Clinton, Obama, Edwards, they probably have more than 100 each. I, I mean, I know Clinton and Obama do. Um, I, I, they have a lot of people in the state. And right, I mean, Rom, you know, Romney poured tons of money into it. I think yeah, uh, Sam yeah. Brown back at least got like his three people. Um, and what he did is he brought in his campaign staff from uh, New Hampshire and South Carolina and from Arkansas. Um, so for about uh, a week and a half before the straw poll, they were all out there um, beating the bushes and getting people out. And you also had a post about a, a third party group that uh, kind of helped them out a little bit. Yes, the uh, the fairtax.org, the uh, group that is trying to push a national sales tax, um, also bust a lot of people to the straw poll, and Huckabee was the only one of the main Republicans who was there that day um, who supports this fair tax proposal, and consequently he probably got a, lot, a fair number of votes from the fair tax people. So they yeah, helped boost him a little bit. I also heard that the Club for Growth ads against him backfired because they just sent people to his website. Oh well, I I, I was going to bring up the Club for Growth ads myself. It was it was you know kind of interesting to see two tax groups because the Club for Growth yeah. Cl Club for Growth ads were hitting him on taxes, and they poured um, I want to say a good eight hundred eight eight uh, one hundred eighty thousand dollars into into ads for the week preceding Iowa caucuses, right. um, and you know they didn't have anything it's on the ground. All they yeah. did was was put the, uh, the the money in the ads, whereas opposed to the Fair Tax Group. Right. Which is, uh, they poured about, you know, um, a little bit more, I think, even than Huckabee did with his campaign into putting into getting people there. I mean, they had buses right. going there. Huckabee didn't bus anybody in. No, the uh, fair tax should definitely spend more than Huckabee, yeah. um, but but less less than Club for Growth. And um, I, it was it was eye opening to uh, people in, in D.C. to see the fair tax group. Um, you yeah. know, basically kick the club for growth spot I mean, at I think, a, uh, Iowa straw poll. Yeah, that was interesting. I think what's going to happen now, though, I mean, Iowa is going to be so important for the Republicans, and this is this just a fascinating thing. I mean, historically, you know, the Republicans, they kiss the purple. They go with, you know, whoever's next in line, um, the heir apparent. And this time that's not happening. There is no heir apparent. Um, the national polls are out of sync with the Iowa and New Hampshire polls. The bump that someone's going to get coming out of Iowa is going to benefit, I think, the Republicans even more than the Democrats coming out of that state. I mean... No, depending on how well known that person is. Right. I mean, and how well positioned they are elsewhere. But, I mean, if Mitt Romney wins, and right now I think he's in a very solid position to win. I mean, for a while I thought maybe Giuliani has a chance in the state. There's a lot of enthusiasm for Giuliani. People really like him uh, on the Republican side. They like his toughness. Um, they like his anti-immigration message right now. Um, they're not quite as concerned about the hypocrisy question. I mean, With the flip-flopping thing is something that really um, has, uh, so far, has tarred Romney rather than... Um, rather than Giuliani, but now I feel like with this new gay marriage decision in the state, I just, it's, I just, it's not going to happen for Giuliani there. I can't. Um, you mentioned Giuliani. You mentioned uh, immigration. Is, is Romney not stressing immigration as, uh, Romney as much stretch, in Iowa? Romney does stress immigration as well. He does. He really? has a strong uh, message on immigration. Um, he especially uh, talks about uh, he frames it as border security, and I think that's how a lot of Republicans like to talk about it. They like to talk about it as a border security question rather than an immigration uh, uh, question, per se, because they feel like when it's framed as immigration, then they're seen as being racist or anti-Mexican or something like that. And so they're trying to say, it's no, we're really concerned about border security. We're fine with Mexicans. It's border security. But, you know, I mean, people can question that sincerity of that distinction. So, so both Giuliani and, and Romney are, are pushing the uh, immigration line pretty hard. Yeah, they're both taking a tough line on immigration. And immigration is really the issue that killed John McCain because John McCain basically single-handedly revived the Republican base in Iowa and probably around the country um, with it, the immigration bill. Oh, yeah. He, yeah, that was that was definitely no doubt about the death knell of yeah. his campaign. Yeah, that basically killed the McCain campaign, and it's sad. Um, uh, have you have you paid attention at all to the uh, uh, land raids with uh, Michigan and Florida moving up their dates and how that might affect the, uh, co the uh, Iowa caucuses? I have been assured in no uncertain terms that the caucuses are remaining in 2008. Yeah, I, it's looking like Michigan and Florida have uh, tried to move up their, their primaries to January 15th and January 29th, um, but uh, all the uh, major candidates, Obama, Edwards, I think Clinton. if Iowa did it in 2007, it would be a disaster, and I think both the Republicans and the Democrats recognize that. It would either 
massively decrease Iowa's power because it would mean basically it would be so early that so much could change over the holidays and once campaigning resumed in January that Iowa just wouldn't have the impact that it does or it would be very disorienting to people. I mean, it just seems wrong to have that the campaign get that early. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they're moving up any I don't think they're going they to get, they're, I mean, I think the earliest date I've heard is January 5th, but right now they're committed to staying on January 14th. Right, and it's, look, it's looking like the major candidates are falling in line to, yes. to not campaign in Michigan and right, Florida. Right, right, right. Um, um, which is actually kind of a, you know, it's really kind of, Hillary was the last one to commit to not campaign in Michigan and Florida. Right, well, I mean, obviously the, she's, you know, probably the strongest in both of those states of anybody. Exactly, running. and it's, yeah. it's really kind of to her advantage to have nobody campaigning in those states because she's a front runner there, so if, if, if everything stays the same there, then that, then that benefits her, so it wasn't much of a loss for her. Right, exactly. Um, um, but, you know, obviously she probably had to talk to a lot of people and think about it a lot before um, she could just come out and say yes or no. I mean, Edwards, it's an easy decision. You know, Iowa is make or break for John Edwards. Right, Iowa is right. his whole game right now. I mean, although he, he apparently has a stronger operation in New Hampshire than some people um, expect. I think Mark Ambinder wrote about this recently on his blog about how he got a, a reasonably large crowd out in New Hampshire. And, um, and, and that's something to pay attention to because I know that Kerry started getting larger crowds out in New Hampshire at a point where um, everybody had written him off for dead, and um, that was the first time that he was experiencing a comeback. Which ultimately then panned out first in Iowa, though. But. Right, exactly. Um, did, before we leave here, did you see uh, Bill Richardson's quote on, uh, on why he will uh, campaign in Iowa and not, and not Michigan and Florida? Uh, I, I mean, I heard him tell other people because you're first. I mean. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was, quote, Iowa, for good reason, for constitutional reasons, for reasons related to the Lord, should be first. So, oh, so divine, just, you know, divine providence for the Iowa caucus. He's just, you know, having fun. <laughs> I, it, he got a laugh out of me, so I, I'll, I'll chalk that up to fun. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think that's a gives viewers a good idea of what's going on in uh, politics heading into so. the fall. Yes, and I'm glad we were able to manage to redo this. And um, next time, no wardrobe malfunctions from either of us. On either side. On either side. Okay. I'll look forward to seeing your red t-shirt. <laughs> okay, talk to you later.